Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to my program here in the afternoon session. At the end of the conference, it's wonderful to see you all. Thank you. My name is Adrienne Herrick Warren, and I am the director of the Emporia State University MLS program in Salt Lake City, Utah. We educate librarians across the region in the, the mountain area. And I'm also the library director for the Salt Lake City Public Library, Bay Riverside branch. So I do public library and academic library. I'm currently the Utah Library Association president and also co-chairing the MCLA Leadership Institute. So it's been an exciting time in my career. And what I came to talk to you today about is MBA learning and how business practices can inform the things we do in libraries and also help us partner with businesses in our communities to serve them. First of all, I was wondering if anyone here has an MBA. You do. Wonderful. I'm glad to see that. Well, I'm here. Yeah, that's you're here. Wonderful. Thanks for coming. This is something that I think librarians are starting to think about more and more. Uh, in 2003, Elizabeth Leonard, who was the re reference librarian at Wake Forest University and worked with businesses, went to get her MBA. And she asked the question, why an MBA? Why would we want to do this? And she did a study weighing the benefits of the MBA. And she felt like, for one thing, it provided some increased subject knowledge in business. It also helped her personally become a better leader and manager. And when she did a survey, others said the same thing. Also, she, she felt like it was possible to get a promotion sometimes with the MBA learning and increased respect and credibility, as well as sometimes salaries. But also, it takes librarians beyond the realm of just the library and sometimes into business industry and business librarianship, or even becoming a chief information officer, for example, in a business. I'm a public librarian. I serve businesses all the time. And in the library, I'm at the Dave Riverside branch of the Salt Lake City Public Library. Now, I used to run what was called the Sugar House branch, which is a bedroom community of the Salt Lake area proper. And I worked with what was called the Merchants Association. And we embedded a librarian within the Merchants Association. I'm sure you all know what embedded librarians are. We had someone at all of their association meetings and able to respond to their needs and help them with their resource knowledge. And we learned a lot from them, too, just being in that community. And in these economic times, it definitely makes sense for libraries to develop as outstanding resources and partners in business development. I have a few uh, slides today. Um, if you're a slide person, feel free to look at them. I'm not necessarily a slide person, but since we're going to be talking about a lot of concepts, I thought I'd put a few of them up on there. Um, another article from 2006 that was done in Bloomberg Business Week called The Library, The Next Best Thing to an MBA, explored how libraries have the basic knowledge that you can get in an MBA, and we provide that to our communities for free. There are an estimated 500,000 new small businesses launched in the United States annually, and of those, 80% fail, which is kind of a scary statistic. Um, in the article, the author, explored what we offer as libraries at little or no cost to business leaders and how this might benefit them. Things like how to get a business license, how to write a business plan, how to secure bank financing, negotiate patents and trademarks, conduct internet marketing, follow industry trends, learn about demographic markets, and a lot more. So libraries do all of this. And some engage even deeper in their communities with workshops, seminars, assistance programs for businesses. In the article, uh, there was a program that was done in Manhattan in 2006, which was sponsored by Citibank. Citibank came to the library and said, we'd really like to help small businesses in your area. And we're willing to put some money up to make this happen by getting information out to the community and offering money as a competition for whoever can come to the library and learn about writing a business plan, writing uh, about marketing. And so the, the story is that two friends came to this program and wanted to start a restaurant. They went through the whole program, and they opened a restaurant called Pagoda Latin Bistro in Manhattan. Because they did such a good job in the program, they submitted their proposal, and they got $10,000 toward opening it in 
startup cash and they got ten thousand dollars toward business related services and that restaurant is still going strong today so really they kind of got an mba experience through the library and when they opened on their grand grand opening night of course they invited all the librarians to help us <laughs> absolutely wonderful but the question we're going to answer today is what about business lear learning for libraries how can business learning benefit what we do it's obvious that we're partners for businesses but how can businesses help shape our thinking? The theme for the 2012 annual conference in Anaheim was transforming our libraries ourselves. We're all aware that information service provision is changing and librarians are not standing by the wayside. We're looking for ways to stay strong and relevant in our field and to better serve our community. So let's think for a moment about the ways businesses change when they experience market forces or pressures. If you're a nonprofit, um, it's going to be a little bit different than if you're a for-profit business. If you're for-profit and your business flips, obviously you're going to have to make some quick, quick adjustments or your bottom line is going to fail and you're going to go out of business. You have to rev uh, generate revenue to survive. And I think if we think about this, if we compare businesses and libraries, I'm going to ask all of you, to help me fill in the blanks. Successful businesses are, just one word, what, what successful businesses are what? Profitable, energetic. flexible, say again. Energetic. energetic, absolutely. Okay, let's try with libraries. Successful libraries are? In the black. In the black, yeah. yes, <laughs> as, our small, as our businesses. <laughs> flexible. I agree, which would be the same for businesses too, to some degree, right? Well, there is a great debate out there about businesses and libraries. Libraries are not businesses. And as we've already seen, businesses do fail at a high rate, so why would we even want to go there? Um, there's a book written by Jim Collins called Good to Great. I don't know if any of you have read it, but in it, he did a lot of research to or how businesses go from being good businesses to being great businesses and out-compete their com competitors using a number of measures that he found to be true for, for most businesses, including how do you define great, how do you develop level five leadership, what he's called le level five leadership, who you get on the bus in your organization. Some objective criteria for what a good settlement will be you can start out by saying, well, what are the rules of this negotiation? What, what is our relationship that we're hoping to gain out of this? And let's brainstorm these and how will we both know when we have a fair deal? And then before you start negotiating, you're going to want to put into place some preparation. And when business negotiators go in, they always have what they call prep docs, preparation documents. And when a negotiator walks into a room and then they see the other party doesn't have prep docs, in front of them, they know that they're probably going to get the best deal out of the situation. When you're developing prep docs, um, you're going to want to just basically put on paper for your own reference, what are your interests in this negotiation? In, in this negotiation, what are mine? What are the other parties? And where do they overlap? Also, what are alternatives? What would constitute legit legitimacy and fairness in the deal? And how can I communicate with this party? What are the communication methods I might use to really move this negotiation forward? Also, what are the relationships in this negotiation? Oftentimes, we are not working with a vendor just once. We might, we might be working with them for long term. And we don't want to just alienate that for ready for a deal with a vendor or, or someone else. And also, you need to do your research and review ahead of time. You should research what other deals people have gotten on products, um, what reviews have been done, and you, you have that all in your mind going in. Librarians, you know, we can negotiate for services for our organizations, and that will translate into greater profit for our communities. And always, always remember, you want ethical short-term and long-term strategies that will help you move your mission and your vision forward. Um, okay. So another principle in um, business learning is competitive advantage. 
A competitive advantage is what makes you different, what makes you stand out from what else is available out there. In business, it answers the question, why should I buy from you? In a library, why should I use your library? And competitive advantage is creating value for your customers through processes, products, services, and you're hoping that it can't be duplicated by your competitors. And we do have competitors as librarians, right? First thing you're going to look at is your brand. Is your product valuable, rare, inimitable, and non-substitutable? And hopefully I've got those. Yeah, there they are. So valuable, we have to create value for our customers that they're willing to go out of their way for. Are they going to stop what they're doing in their day and come to the library and why would they do that? Is it rare? Can other people match what we're doing and can they give better delivery or service than what we can? Inimitable, can what we do be is easily imitated? It's certainly not easy to create the collection that our nation's library carry. We know that. And non-substitutable. We need to offer services, facilities, collections, staff that people can't get elsewhere. You cannot replace librarians. You just can't. And then there are four building blocks to competitive advantage. You want efficiency, quality, customer responsive, responsiveness, and innovation. Efficiency. We need, as we talked about inputs and outputs earlier, you need to have create the greatest output for your input. So what can you get for your budget that's going to make the biggest difference in your community? Quality. Are we providing the best information and databases and collections? Customer responsiveness. What do our patrons experience when they interact with our organization and its people? I like to tell my staff, please create raving fans. When they leave our building, we want them to talk about what they experienced in our library. And then innovation without it, our product loses appeal. If we're doing the same thing year after year, are, are they going to keep coming back? So we right now in the City Library, we're developing a new branch. I've been working on that project for a number of years. And one of the first things we did was create an innovation and ideas committee to inform the project. We had a Facebook page. And people could just Throw out ideas, they could be crazy ideas, but at least it's trying to think of new ways to serve. And it's been a lot of fun to look at those innovations and think of how we can put those into a new building. We have a lot of competitive advantage as librarians, and we need to keep building on those aspects of what we do. Um, and there are ways that we can do this. First of all, we need to develop a strategy formulation for our organization. And um, to do that, you're going to, of course, establish a mission. You need to also do an external analysis and an internal analysis. And most libraries are lucky in that they have their mission in place and they have a review process every so often to examine that and make sure that it stays relevant and timely. Um, and it's important for the people who work for us to know what that mission is and to have a good understanding of why it's there. You can do a lot of this with external analysis. And what an external analysis does is it looks at the factors outside our walls, outside our libraries, that are putting pressure on us, causing us to look at change, causing us to need to be relevant continually. Internal analysis involves looking at functions within our organization, such as operations, departments, and gen our general internal structure. And then you can take both of those and build your strategy for your organization. So let's look first at external company analysis. If you want, one thing that can be useful is to look at your um, upstream and downstream in your industry. So upstream would be those, you're kind of in the middle. You've got organizations upstream, like your funding sources, who provides the resources for you to do what you do. Also, vendors. Who are you working with upstream that are providing you resources that you then provide to those downstream who are your consumers? Downstream from you, you might be wanting to look at your partners. Who are you bringing into your organization who can help you accomplish your mission? And finally, at the bottom, is the consumer yourself. So you want to look at all the aspects that go into providing service for your consumer. And look at all the layers. Um, one of the things that 
you all might be familiar with the SWOT analysis, SWOT, so strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The OT part of SWOT, opportunities and threats, are the external things that you will factor in. And there are a number of tools you can use to do this that are quite useful. One of them is a SLEPT analysis, which I put on the slide here. A SLEPT analysis is looking at the social, legal, economic, political, and technological aspects of what we do. So for social, that's a big thing for libraries. What, if, what are mobile devices doing for what we do? What about social networking? Those are things we can't ignore. Economically, uh, we felt the economic downturn. Legally, what, what is your, if you're a nonprofit, what are you able to take in in terms of funds? How, how might that help you? How might that be a threat? Politically, what impacts do legislation, legislative actions have in your area? In Utah, where I serve, we have a filtering law actually that determines the amount of funding we can get in our organization. So we have to consider that when we develop our plans. And technological. Obviously technology has a huge, huge impact on what we do. What about distance education? How are we dealing with that? Mobile devices, online books, which we all talked about already. And what do uh, what technology do our patrons want and need? These are good ways to look at external forces. We also have a model called Porter's Five Forces, and I don't think libraries have often thought about competition, but I, I know we're all starting to. Um, what are the threats of competition? Are there others out there offering what we're offering, what we do as libraries? What about the uh, bargaining power of customers? This is interesting because what impact do our patrons have on what they're willing to pay for our services? And are they willing to tell our legislators or governing bodies that they want to spend money on our services? You hear it quite often here. Threat of substitutes. Is Google a viable substitute for libraries? We all know absolutely not. <laughs> but is there a perception that there might be and how do we overcome that? Um, barriers of entry. What keeps other entities from taking the place of libraries? As librarians, we know that our facilities, our knowledgeable personnel, our unique programming, our comprehensive collections, they are absolutely impossible to, to duplicate. And how do we demonstrate that? Also, you'll want to do a competitive analysis, and this is crucial. Study your consumer. Who are they? Why do they use your library? What values and features do they prefer? What do they think is neat about your library? And you can do this. You've probably all done some of this, focus group surveys. But when you're doing that, don't forget to look at who's not using your services and why. That's important. And then frankly, look frankly at what you've discovered and ask yourself questions that will help you build your strategy. Once you've all done all this, you'll have your opportunities and your threats, and you can prioritize those. And as you do your external analysis, remember it's important to keep really good records. So you can show what factors are influencing you. And also check with your colleagues and team members, because they're great sources of information. And they'll, they'll have kind of a check and balance effect to make sure you're on the right page. And then you can set your strategy and move forward. As part of setting a strategy for your organization, it's also important to look at your own internal analysis, which includes asking yourself a lot of questions about what's happening inside your organization. This is the SW of the SWAT, the strengths and weaknesses. So function, how well is our library working? Um, let's see if I've got that. Did I put, I didn't put um, that up there, but I'll just give you these. Uh, infrastructure and leadership, how well is our strategy defined? And do we encourage idea sharing as leaders in our organization? Operations, do we have quality control measures for what we do? Can we tell how we're doing? What about information management internally? How do we share information among departments, among people? Finance, are we meeting our financial goals and creating the most profit based on the income we have? Research and development, how long in our organization does it take to fully develop an idea and get it out there in a new way? And 
once you've done your internal analysis, you gather all this information. Sometimes it's useful to put it into kind of a matrix. You can list all of your resources, competencies, building blocks, functions, and then you rate them on a scale of how strong are you on that, and then you can fill in where you might want to do some development. You could also do a BRIN, like we talked about all already, how internally, how valuable, rare, inevitable, or not substitutable is this for our organization. And then you can start beginning to do trainings or whatever you need. So say your staff is really strong on your circulation functions and your internal databases, but they have questions about some programs and apps that maybe your patrons have questions about. Then you can start building programs to boost that in your organization. It takes time, but overall I think it's worthwhile and it does inform your strategic planning. So what does all of this get, get us? It sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? But also it makes us responsive. So once you've done all of this, you know, your library's going to run like a well, well machine, right? <laughs> you've got your contracts, your plans, your performance standards, everything's going to be negotiated. You'll know your competitive advantage and how to keep your library relevant and strong. You'll have your external factors, your internal factors. You'll know how to develop this into a feedback loop, and all is well, right? <laughs> You've got me. Now you can sit back and enjoy the ride. Well, maybe. <laughs> but how are our consumers going to know this is going on? How are they going to know we've done all of this? What is our value to them, and why should all of this make a difference? Well, that brings us to marketing. Libraries need advocacy. and. Um, as president of the Utah Library Association, my theme for the year is aim for the future on target with vision and advocacy. This is so important for what we do in libraries today. Um, people need to know what we have to offer. And as I came up through the library world, we always had a community affairs department. That's what any interaction outside our walls was called. It was just, we're talking to people, we're letting them know what we do. Now we're actually doing marketing, which I find very interesting. And one of the things you can do to promote, you've got these amazing products. And one of the things you can do to promote them is to develop a positioning statement. And this is interesting because we all have these elements of what we do. So a positioning statement, first of all, you're going to want to know your primary target customer or consumer you're going to want to know the need or opportunity that you have to fulfill within your community. And then you're going to, of course, develop a product or service to meet that need. And it'll have a product category. And you'll want to know what your key benefit is of that. And then what makes that different from what anybody can get out there in the rest of the community. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how this might work. So, Say you're trying to promote your preschool story time. It's like an ad list. We're just going to pop these in. Um, so a positioning statement for preschool story time might be for preschoolers who need to enter kindergarten ready to read, the library's preschool story time, do you see that there under need or opportunity, is a free program that offers exposure to early literacy skills and provides a jump start to lifelong learning that can only begin inside the walls of the library. That is a positioning statement for preschool story time. Let's try one for the Utah Library Association, because I've just been working on it. For the Utah Library Association members who want an excellent professional development opportunity, the annual spring conference is a once-a-year activity that offers access to Utah-based networking resources and advocacy information and provides the only source of face-to-face -face professional affiliation of this scale in the state. A couple of real quick positioning statements. So it's fun to try this with your organization. It's fun to plug in your um, key terms and, and goals. And you can try it with any of the services you offer. So from your positioning statements, you're going to want to develop your marketing plan. And what this is called in, the, in business learning is a marketing mix. And I've got the four P's right here for developing a marketing mix. They are product, price, place, and promotion. So you all have a product. 
And your product should easily capture the attention of your consumers and satisfy their, their wants and their needs. And as you've seen today, you can develop the attributes through all these things, the negotiation, the competitive advantage, the internal external analysis, and of course, your strategic planning. And um, the things you come up with might be all types of things, depending on what organization you're in. They might be maybe fun story times, they might be professional development opportunities, electronic collections, other services you want to define that for yourself. But your product is what you have to offer. And you need to market to your consumers so they can learn about what you have. Otherwise, they, they, they won't know. They won't be able to take advantage of them. And then price. We're not used to looking at this because we don't do direct sales. But what is the monetary value of a particular good or service? Today, we're seeing that libraries are advocating for their organizations by doing studies that, de that demonstrate return on investment. The Utah State Library recently did a study that showed for every dollar that taxpayer money is invested in libraries, there is a $7.35 return on investment. And that shows and puts in the mind of the consumer, of the consumer our patrons, that they're getting value for the dollar. It's, it's important. People want to know they're getting a good deal in libraries. Place. Place is the way our consumers obtain our products and services. In business, it's called distribution. And place is um, how do people access what we do? Do we have neighborhood branches in public libraries? Is there a bookmobile, remote access databases, websites, mobile apps? The greater ease and options that we give people, in business, it creates greater sales. In libraries, it creates utilization. We want our place in the market to include great access for our patrons. And the more ways we can do that and make it easy for them, the more business we'll have. And then, of course, promotion. And that's the use of communication tools, promotional activities that ensure the maximum information. And actually, in business, they have persuasive impact on customers. We hope to persuade them to use our library. Um, they can re remind, inform, persuade, and basically, they tell about the importance of what we do. Um, there are a lot of tools for marketing. Public, public relations, for example, um, newspaper articles about programs you're doing. Direct marketing, you can always do mailers. Um, and of course, it all depends on input, right, our budget. But um, you wouldn't think of sales and promotions in libraries, but has anybody offered 50% of 50 cents off fines, coupons, you get pay, pay, patrons in. It gets them through the door. In my organization, in the fall, right before the holidays, we always do a food for fines program where people can bring in a can of food and get a certain amount off their fines, and we like to get people through the door that way. So that's actually sales and promotions, believe it or not. Personal sales. Personal sales is one, one contact. It's things like outreach activities. Are you going out and talking to people about what you're doing? Also, is your staff, your friend group, your board members, are they talking about the importance of libraries at every opportunity? Those are personal sales. And of course, advertising. Some libraries put signs on buses. Um, you can put things in school newsletters. There's social media. Many of us are actually marketing on Facebook and Twitter promoting our programs and collections and ideas. So developing marketing that advocates for library services has become more and more important, especially in this day and age, because we are experiencing greater pressures and our information industry is rapidly changing. And you know, a lot of that has to do with the economic downturn. Um, marketing is not something we had to do in the past, but we can, I think, learn from some of these business practices and benefit from them. So in conclusion, today we've talked about business learning and how it ties into libraries. We've talked about providing library, librarians with learning to support business efforts in communities. We've talked about developing business resources as even a substitute for an MBA for small businesses and large companies. We've explored whether libraries should even consider business strategies and also talked about the parallels between the library world and the business world and how we create profit. It's a really interesting way to think. 
And of course, we explored business concepts of negotiation, competitive advantage, internal, external analysis, and marketing. The question is, can libraries take a page out of the book of business to create strategies for success? I think libraries and businesses can certainly benefit by informing one another. But I will say librarians are very good at what we do. We have a proud historic record of providing people with the information and resources they need to create great intellectual wealth for our nation. Current technological, social, and economic pressures are created, creating rapid change in the information industry. But librarians have long adapted to changes in information formats, packaging, and delivery methods. So while the pace of change may have accelerated, we know how to respond, and we know how to advocate for what we do. Business models are one way to look at things. However, librarians have been and always will be adaptable, resourceful, and resilient practitioners of providing information services. We have the resources we need at our disposal to create innovation, innovative libraries of the future, and we know how to use them. So business practices are among them, but librarians are in charge. Thank you. Questions slash okay, comment. Um, Question slash comment. Uh, yeah, really, I'm very pleased that you brought this to this group. I wish there were a wider audience. Oh. Because this is a, a lesson that many librarians and captains should share. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, so that's part of the question. Yeah. The National Network Library of Medicine, we have a web page for our mid continental region. And on here, we have a section for promoting libraries and librarianship. So we have like a little uh, return on investment calculator for you know, the number of books or references or services that you provide for your library. I hope that you'll use it, promote it. Um, sure. Because uh, it's a great tool for public libraries and medical libraries. Yeah, return on investment calculator. I love that. Uh, NNLM.gov slash MCR. Or you can see me afterwards. I'll give you my card. <laughs> <laughs> Just see her at the end. She's got her card. Um, okay, that too. Like she great. Answers, yes. Thank you very much. Issues. Any other questions or thoughts before we close? Mostly complete. Yeah. So, okay. Just ten minutes of class and then all this. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. We did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And many different things. Mm -hmm. But yeah. one of the things, yeah. I think, we're going to have to be very careful and not to take it too far in the way of maybe me. Absolutely. So they have to be more cautious. I also think we have to increase our knowledge of our, our record keeping and book keeping. I mean, you know, libraries that like their groups that get money and they just they don't track it properly. Mm -hmm. So then you can really kind of so there's a couple learn the business models that we yeah. So you've got a couple layers, especially with negotiation. I think one of the things you're talking about is relationships within negotiation, and that's huge. That's one of the big things taught in at least in the program I'm in Los Angeles. Learn about relationships in negotiation, and also ethical use of negotiation. Um, and then also the bookkeeping and financial aspect of businesses that, that libraries can use that is becoming more important. That is our input, and we are responsible stewards of those funds for creating great output for our communities. So, for our you. city, we can have any idea. Like, and my administrators are like, that we need to understand library grants. I don't understand what we do. Mm -hmm. So, I had to go and go with. And I said, for instance, you always just let us keep donation money. Why are we not receiving this in and, and keeping a record of it? Mm -hmm. I don't want all this cash in my library. Right. And he was shocked to find out how much turns over. And I keep thinking about the quarter a day. No. No, more than a quarter a day. quarter, like 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I think it's my go shopping. I'm not like a couple hundred bucks. You know, I mean, it's just they're not always well, aware true. of record keeping. The record they don't know what to do. They don't. And it's something we do not learn in library school. We don't learn the nickels and dimes and dollars. How do we manage those funds? 
and what is our accountability process. So for me, MBA learning has been invaluable. I think the more we can educate ourselves on business and financial practices, the more it will help us moving forward. Do you see, and this is kind of off a little bit, but not really, do you see the difference of which would be better, an MBA or an MCA? Well, I think that's pers personal choice. I, I've, I've seen both. I think the MBA is very valuable. Um, I don't, I haven't got one, so I don't know quite how to compare it. Um, I like the financial end and the promotional end, but I think you do get some of this. Does anyone have an MPA? I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can you help address the MPA side of it? Um, well, I chose MPA over MBA because I want to focus in on um, nonprofit and government and, um, and not necessarily the business and financial private aspect. But in the in MPA program, they do compare notes. Uh -huh. so, Okay. And there's a financial component in the MPA? There is fiscal responsibility. Fiscal responsibility. Okay. Very good. So I think I think both are great too. That I don't know. Maybe are you the person to talk to about that? The slides? I, I can yeah. make the slides available. Those, those go on those need to go to the MPLA website for okay. instructions. So. I will uh, I will give that to them. Yeah, that yeah I always send it to them anyway. I, yeah. I know there was a deadline on that, but I, I, I know I, 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 I think we're going to use a PowerPoint. I, I think that deadline was to make sure they were up before the event. Okay. I, I think you can still send them okay. slides okay. and they'll still post them. Thank you. Just those lists. Yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, I'm glad I did it if it was useful. <laughs> I almost didn't. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great talking to all, all of you today. Thank you for coming. And feel free to let me know. I have cards if anybody would like my card. I have those up here and I'm willing to talk to anyone afterwards. I think we're at the end of the day, so we have more time. Well, thank you for coming to the Oh, yes, thank, you. thank you for having me. It's beautiful. <laughs>